I can't tell you how exciting it is to not be looking at my computer screen in little squares, although I appreciated seeing so many of you uh, over these last couple years. It's just much nicer uh, to be here in this room and say hello um, and see you and hopefully have a chance after this meeting to connect and talk with you. Um, you know, about the last couple years, um, hopefully you've been in the parks and enjoying them. Um, but this is a really fun opportunity for me personally, but for us as an organization to thank you all for your outstanding support, most especially these last couple of years. Um, you can well imagine as a nonprofit organization when this first unfolded, it was unsettling to figure out what was gonna happen. We were just in the process of being really excited about celebrating our 50th anniversary. We were rolling out a capital campaign. Uh, there were all these exciting things that we were happy to reach out and talk to everybody about. And then things changed and really dramatically for all of us. Um, but your support has made all the difference, um, as well as the hard, hard work of everyone in our office who, many of our office folks are here with us tonight and I just want to say a thank you because um, it's been trying and challenging to figure out ways to, to do the work we do, but they have been extraordinary. Uh, and I hope you've seen it uh, in your connection with us either remotely, electronically, or most especially uh, in, in our parks. So again, thank you very much for s sticking with us and being so supportive. Um, we're excited for this evening as well. Uh, we have our new state senator, Lydia Edwards, who's here as our speaker. I'm personally really excited. I had the great opportunity to hear Lydia as a speaker a couple weeks ago, and I knew that she was impressive. Many of uh, my former colleagues worked with Lydia uh, at Holland and Knight, and everyone said, have you met Lydia yet? Have you met Lydia? Um, and it's, it's really a joy to hear her story. Um, she's inspiring. Um, she exemplifies the idea of resiliency. Um, and many of you, if you don't know, she just ran the Boston Marathon. Uh, so we're all excited. She's working great. Anyway, she's going to tell you her story, and I'm looking forward to that uh, tonight. I'd like to thank also, I think I saw Senator Livingstone, Jay Livingstone, are you with us there? Hello. Representative. Representative. I'm sorry. Whoa. I elevated you. But thank you very much. Um, I know that Kenzie Bach is tied up, but has sent a representative from her office to be with us. And so um, thank you as well. Um, what I'm going to do now is just move along uh, to the agenda for the evening. Um, and the first order of business is going to be the uh, minutes of the annual meeting, which were distributed for our last meeting, which was April the 15th, 2021. I'm sure you all remember that scintillating night, right? Um, I'd like to call, please, if I could, for a vote for the approval of those meeting minutes. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So the motion moves. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I'll let you get on with the evening. Uh, I'm going to ask Kate Enroth, who is our government's chair, to come up and have a word with you tonight about her sleep. Okay? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Kate Enroth. I'm chair of the governance committee. And I am pleased to present our recommendation for the election of the following people to the Board of Directors for a three-year term. Pamela Albright. Well, let me see if this, no. Yeah, okay. Pamela Albright, Alex Hastings, Margaret Picorne, and Brent Shea. And at this time, we can just have a vote. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Bordewick. I'm the treasurer of uh, Friends. And um, what I'm going to do in the next five minutes or so is just talk a little bit about our 2001 results and compare those to our 2020 results. And I'm not going to force you to, I'm not going to march through too many of these numbers on the page, but uh, just a few highlights first. So how did we do in 2021? 
So the Friends did work really, really hard and had a very strong year despite the uncertainties and sort of shifting variables of the pandemic. Uh, we had an excellent finish to the year and into a strong cash position. And i um, happy to say we, the organization was very successful executing on a lot of ongoing and new projects in a remote work environment. And how is that possible? So first, you know, we continued to benefit enormously from the generosity of our supporters and members like you who are here tonight. Um, our 2001 budget contemplated two scenarios because of the uncertainty around the pandemic. We had what we call an expanded budget, which was sort of like our budget from prior years, just um, toned down a bit. And then we had a scary thing called an essential budget, which was if things really got bad, you know, what was sort of the bare minimum that we need to do, you know, more or less to sort of keep the lights on. And we were able <clears throat> throughout 2020 to manage to the expanded budget, and we didn't have to manage to the um, <clears throat> to the essential budget. Um, and those the sort of results that we had were really driven by the you know the creativity, as Liz mentioned, you know, the creativity and the resilience and the flexibility of the staff and the people responsible uh, for the financial management of the organization. Liz, Steve Enbarge, who's our financial manager, and the guru of the liaison manager, who's sitting in the back of the room, and then all of the all the friends, staff, and uh, the stewardship of the board. We accomplished that without taking any PPP loans, and uh, we had a clean audit report for our last year. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about some of these pie charts and to take you through a couple of, of, uh, of the highlights there. So on the income side, we did have a modest increase in income um, last year. Oops. Uh, all right, so our total income last year was $3.2 million. That was up about 6% compared to about $3 million the year before. You'll see that support continues to comprise the most significant contributor to our income, 53%. That consists of things like membership, designated and undesignated contributions, requests, special events, proceeds, didn't have too many of those last year. But it was 10% higher than the previous year, primarily due to you know, generous corporate gifts uh, from Mount Zegna on Newbury Street and the success of our 50th anniversary celebration. While membership was a bit lower than in 2020, it still exceeded our budget and demonstrated, I think, the continued relevance of the Friends uh, to our members. Uh, some events you know, had to be canceled or they morphed in form. Uh, for example, the Duckling Day and Making History on the Common events went virtual and the Brewer Fountain Plaza programming was only in effect for half of the year. And then uh, finally, uh, the rolling average value of our investments measured at um, the date where we measure this every year for the purpose of determining our formula draw, so that's September 30th of every year, uh, increased uh, about a million bucks from a little bit over 20 million to a little bit over $21 million. And that gave us sort of growing support uh, from that formula draw to, to support our operations. The value of the endowment at the end of 2021 stood at uh, $28.6 million. On, ex <clears throat> on expenses, uh, the predominant expense you know, continues to be park care at 73%, followed by development at 20%, and a sort of small administrative component of uh, 7%. Last year, uh, total expenses were $3.1 million. That's 24% higher than the almost two and a half million dollars that we spent in 2020. Still lags the 3.6 million that we spent in uh, 2019, but it shows sort of this trend back toward a normalized expense level. Um, having say parks care last year increased 42% over the year before, after a 48% decrease in 2020 over 2019 due to the pandemic. Uh, public programming increased by 12% primarily due to the return of the half season of the Brewer Fountain Plaza programming. Uh, personnel overhead expenses increased in line with some hiring and other increases in our operating expenses. Uh, we had an overall increase in administration expenses, but those were largely associated with the preparation for the resumption of in-person office activities. Um, so we're doing a project to improve the um, the air circulation and the air climate in the office, and also the installation of better technology to support virtual or, or um, virtual meetings. So um, the upshot is that in 2021, we budgeted 
for an operating deficit of a little bit over $61 million. $61,000. Just wanted to see if you're a fake. $61,000. We finished 2021 with an operating surplus of over $153,000, so about a $215,000 swing in our results. As we've done in previous years, we transferred uh, almost all of that surplus, so about $153,000 from our 2021 results into 2022. And as a result, we ended the year with a, a small net surplus, wait for it, of $400. <laughs> But that contrasts really nicely with a budget of like say, about $61,000. Uh, so and just a couple of comments on our statements of financial position. Um, our total assets are up and our liabilities are down by about the same percentage, about 14%. Our total assets were up by $4.2 million last year. Life, but we don't have significant liabilities, most of it. Uh, it's, it's gonna be something I'll talk about in a minute is our, is our mortgage. So, uh, uh, liabilities are down by $200,000 or so. Our investment performance last year was very, very strong. We're up 15%. <clears throat> that outperformed our benchmark. And uh, thanks to our crack uh, investment committee, our performance remains in the top 25% of the Cambridge Associates universe of uh, nonprofit endowments of $100 million or less. Um, lastly, we're continuing to um, act as a fiscal agent for a million and a half dollar grant from a charitable trust for a multi-year program to operate uh, public restrooms in the commune. Uh, due to that pandemic, the 2021 season was sort of shortened, so we spent less money, but we still have uh, like over three years worth of um, funds to continue to operate um, that program. So just in closing, a couple comments about the current year, because we're already a you know, quarter of the way through our current year. Our really strong results last year put us in a great position coming into this year. Uh, we were confident enough not to have two forms of budget this year, so we have one, one uh, single budget, and it gets us substantially back to sort of pre-pandemic level, which we're excited about. So thanks very much for your attention, and I'm going to pass it over to Liz. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Well, this is thrilling. <laughs> You all look beautiful. It's just so wonderful <laughs> to have you in the room. It, it feels like it's been a longer time than since 2019. I think we've all aged and grown and changed. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot to celebrate before we even get to the, the heart of the matter, which is the parks. Because these parks have been like lifesavers for all of us. I have heard from so many of you. I have experienced it myself and how they were absolute lifesavers during a time when you and I, we were all so stressed about this pandemic places for respite, places to come and be able to gather, um, gather and have a time in, in the outdoors. Uh, so they are the green lungs of our city, and they are the heartbeat of our city, and the common and the garden and the mall are very lucky to have you as supporters so that those green lungs can be as healthy as, as possible. So again, thank you for the support that you give us and these parks, we just could not um, do it without you, and these parts could not do it without us. So there are some thanks to some particular people, volunteers. We have two wonderful long-term volunteers. One is very long-term. It's the 35th year of the Rose Brigade. Are there any Rose Brigaders here in the audience? Uh, Shaina Altman, our, our inspiring leader, along with Carl Foster, have been at this for a very long time. That's on the left. On the right-hand side is the Border Brigade, relatively new. It's our seventh year of the Border Brigade. And in fact, today was the first day of this season of the Border Brigade. So thanks for um, Eric Di Tommaso is our parts care specialist, and he guides these wonderful people to come and take care of the borders and the garden and the um, gardens over the back bay. Thank you for your participation in that. And in the middle are our tour guides. They were not out last year. They were not out the year before. They are raring to go. We've got a new class. They can't wait to go out and lead you and guide you around around the, um, the garden. Anybody in any of these volunteered? Or has anybody taken a tour? All right. And I want all of you to come up because we call it the untold stories of the public garden because no matter how long you've lived here and how many times you've been through the garden, there's many things that you don't know <laughs> that you will learn if you come and, and take a tour. So. Thank you to all of them. 
Leslie mentioned our staff. This is not all of them, but it's the first time we were together since the pandemic started outside. So that's a, a, why I love this, this uh, image. On the left is an intern that worked with us last year, Sosina, looking at our, our monuments. We have a couple people who aren't here, are uh, now not new anymore, but wonderful VP Lynn Flaherty. She was in Canton at that day. We have a very new member. You probably uh, saw her, if not met her, Aubrey Woods, who's my new executive assistant, doing a wonderful job. She's out of the table. And we're about ready to hire a new development associate. So we'll be back to 10 of us. We are going in. Please come and visit us. We're in the office Tuesdays and Thursdays together. And again, it's just so wonderful. We've done a great job, as Leslie said, being remote, but there's nothing like being in one another's company and being able to casually engage and interact and remember the things that you've asked me was going to talk to that person about that you wouldn't have remembered if you were at home. So we are in the second year of working with our wonderful DEI consultant, uh, Glenn Gwen Haddon, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion with the goal of making the Friends, our organization, better reflect the diversity of our city, and we're working hard at that. It's not as easy as we'd like, but we want to deepen the diversity of the, the leadership and, and our staff, but also having these parking places where everyone feels welcome, everyone feels included. So a couple of images here on the left is a partnership that we uh, engaged in with Boston Children's Chorus last year. We supported bringing the chorus to parks throughout the city in uh, Chinatown, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, with a concluding concert on the common. So bringing, they have a very strong social justice mission. So that was a wonderful partnership with the BCC. And on the, the right, you see some youth who are green ambassadors that go to Thompson Island in the summer to work there. We invited them to come to the garden to tell us how it felt to be in the garden. Did they feel welcome? Did they feel included? Did they, what, what, what could we do to make this place a place that message to everybody you belong? So first we had them just sort of hang out and experience. It was a beautiful day. And they said, well, what, what words come up to you? And I was happy to hear that in fact they felt invited included, welcome. They love the fact that the trees had labels on them. That said, we also need to do a better job, particularly in the signage. When you enter the garden, the first thing that should greet you is welcome to America's first public botanical garden. You are welcome here. There are wonderful things you can do. And then by the way, you can't bicycle, you can't climb a tree. <laughs> <laughs> but that should be the secondary message. The first message needs to be welcome. You really do belong and we're really happy to have you here. Uh, that's not meant to be an exclamation point, but it's apparently not coming out. <laughs> so that's like a, a mystery picture, but what this is about is our seasonal bathrooms that you heard Jim talk about. We are in um, year four of those bathrooms, and uh, it's an equity issue to have bathrooms in a public park. America does a terrible job providing bathrooms for people. And I'll tell you that this last year, we came out, we did a half season last year, after not being out the year before. The man who's been, uh, who oversees it, who from seven in the morning to nine at night, he is the uh, watch person. So many people came up to tell him how these bathrooms changed their lives, literally. They could come to the park and enjoy them because they had a place to go to the bathroom. You can go to the uh, frog pond, you can go to the visitor center. But these have been really, life-changing, and they're a good pilot project for us. We are finishing this master plan. We're going to be recommending a permanent bathroom building at the uh, big block entrance into the common from the garden. But it is an equity issue. And the other thing that we explored and did a wonderful job with last year and doing it again this year, it's actually a billboard, right? It's not just a trailer, but it's an opportunity for art. So last year, we engaged Sylvia Lopez Chavez who did that wonderful mural, maybe you, a lot of you saw that on the right hand side. And this year we have hired Sobek, who is an artist in the lower left, a muralist, a uh, street artist. He's uh, done murals for the city of Boston. He's doing some in, in Cambridge. So starting next week, you get to come and actually see him paint the mural in the park. So he'll be there for about two weeks. Um, we've fed him a lot of information about the history of the park, the history of the land, he is African-American, but also has native um, blood in him, so he was very connected and interested in hearing about the natives and, and the, the ancient history of this park. But he is a surrealist, so stay tuned and, and, and go out there and see what he does. It should be, it should be fun. 
So it has been another great year in the parks, thanks to your support. And Jim, as Jim said, you know, in 2020, we spent $1.6 million in direct care of these parks. Last year, we were able to raise that up to $2.2 million. So that was just terrific. The beginning starts at the beginning, which is the soil. Um, it is the foundation of a healthy park. The living landscape needs a healthy soil, and we've been in year three of doing soil testing, which has been really wonderful to understand more about the biology and the chemistry of the soil. So that's what those baggies are in the lower right. Um, our parks care specialist goes out to every acre of all three parks and literally collects thousands <laughs> of samples of soil. And he sends them out to labs for chemistry and for biology. We have seen the, the need to raise the pH over the years. We've been adding lime, which is what that is on the left-hand side. We've been doing a great job improving the, the pH. On the right-hand side is a little vial of a compost extract. And so we've been adding that to stimulate the living organisms in the soil, to stimulate the biology. We also add a fish emulsion with lobster and crab. It sounds like dinner, but it actually <laughs> is material that helps the, helps the park and uh, it supports the compost to be able to support the living organism. So it, we just have a really wonderful team thinking about the science in these parks. And a lot of, and going back to the untold stories, is not something that you see and that you know. We, we do talk about it in our communications and our e-news, and we'll, you know, we just shout it from the rooftops of the, the work that we do. And we spend, this year is $826,000 dedicated to the living landscape. So that's almost half of our direct parks care budget because of the importance of it and the importance of trees, as you know. You know, without a tree, it would not be a park. It would be a, maybe an urban green space, but not a park. Um, we take care of all 1,700 trees, and you've heard me talk about this before, but the elm trees are really important. And we have a wonderful couple, Chris and Norm Healy, they are celebrating their 10th anniversary working with us this year. And she is an entomologist, a bug scientist, and him as a soil scientist and arborist have come together to understand deeply what the, the issue is and how the elm bark beetle actually carries the disease of, of Dutch elm disease. We're not going to eradicate this disease, but we have radically reduced the mortality of that tree. So the fact that we have any elms in our parks is because of the work that we've done over the many years, understanding the, the um, disease, understanding how to get ahead of us, of it, and um, understanding how to treat these trees. So they are actually doing some writing about the research they've done because what they've learned in our parks, I think really is gonna change the industry and really change people's thinking about how you can manage this disease. So we're very excited about that and, and our park steer team is working very closely with them on that, um, on that writing. The other thing we were able to get back and do our full uh, program this last year was our, our sculpture care. Um, 42 pieces of public art, and we did nine statues, conservation of nine statues, as well as repointing of a number of stone pieces. Um, Sarah Hutt is our collections care manager, and she's been wonderful in supporting that work, and, and also with vandalism. We just had graffiti um, this last week, and she saw it, and she got one of our sculpture care conservators out, and, and uh, it got taken care of. So, And also, let us know when you see graffiti, don't let the city know, because we do a better job of taking care of it. They have a group called the Graffiti Busters. Their heart's in the right place, but we really know how to carefully remove the graffiti and not leave a ghosting on the stone or, or damage the bronze. So we have a really good relationship with the city. And Ryan was the parks commissioner, couldn't be here. He texted me a little while ago they couldn't get babysitting. So he would be here, and we are joined at the hip, and we love our relationship. It's very important to us, and it's deepened over the years. But there's still some things that are important for us to be doing that the city just doesn't have the capacity to do. And one thing is caring for the sculpture in our parks. And one thing we have been really working hard and closely together is on this um, master plan for Boston Common over the last three years. Over 6,000 people have uh, weighed in on this first, America's first public park. And not just from the neighborhood. This is not just a neighborhood park. These are not just neighborhood parks. They belong to the entire city. So for the purposes of this, we took it on the road. We went to East Boston and Dorchester and JP as well as uh, the Boston Common asking people, what do you think about this park? What is your vision for the future? What are the issues that we need to deal with? 
This is, and I'm gonna point out Jean Bollinger is uh, from Weston and Samson, and they have a great team, so Parks and Friends have been working with them over these years to create this uh, reflection of the best of this park. And not that this park is gonna be a radically different park, but it's gonna be the best version of itself. So we're getting close to being able to send the executive summary to the mayor. It'll be important for her to review it and own it to really be something that then we move on and implement. This image here is a perspective showing the rear of the visitor center. The visitor center could be a better visitor center. Right now is a place that you can go and, and start a tour, or you can get a pamphlet, or you can use one of the very few bathrooms <laughs> spaces that are there. But it really needs to be more of a proper visitor center, understanding the history of the common, understanding the fact that there is a friends group close by, um, knowing more about the, the current uh, life of the park and opportunities. So this shows uh, an expanded center moving back where the, the um, park rangers are, continuing to have park rangers in the space, the space, but also share that space with visitor center opportunity, and then have a, a seating plaza area to connect the, the center to the heart of the park. On the right, you see that image of the embrace. You've seen the construction fencing go up. It's begun. Next week, there's gonna be a groundbreaking. It's very exciting, and if all goes by the plan, there will be a, a celebratory opening on MLK Day of next year. This is, image is another really wonderful, important place in the common. And again, it's interesting because the common, we did uh, counts, pedestrian counts, when we were at the beginning of the plan. Over 40,000 people come into this park every day. But mo mo many of those people are walking through. I mean, it is a crossroad to you know, send you to downtown crossing and, and the financial district. But we want to also capture people. So the back of the visitor center is one way to encourage people to stay a while and, and learn and have fun in this park. And another thing is to improve the frog pond area, to have more opportunity for play, for water play in the summer. As you all know, there was a temporary uh, rink this winter because the whole infrastructure needs massive uh, improvement. So from the Windsor Square garage, crisis that we fought, <laughs> but we also gained money. So we gained $28 million for the common, 23 million of which will be capital money that will go towards this plan. The plan's recommendations will cost over $100 million. So there's other money that we need to find and bring to bear on this. But $5 million has gone to a, uh, a maintenance fund. I'll talk about that in a minute. We are back for a full season at Burr Plaza. Please come and have lunch. We have five wonderful food trucks, a lot of interesting, uh, different food. Um, it is our common living room, and it's a wonderful place to gather. Uh, you know, it's the Boston Common does um, struggle and is challenged by some illicit activity. We all know that there's people that like to come here not for just having fun and for doing positive activity, but to do drugs and sell drugs. And this is one of the places that really it was exacerbated by the pandemic. In 2020, we were not out there at all. In 2021, it was a shortened season. Um, we're reclaiming this place now. We really need to all, positive activity drives that negative activity. So it's wonderful in and of itself, and it's really important that we build that, that capacity and, and positive activity. Not everybody's back in their work zones these days, but there is enough activity in twice this last week. Um, Steve Tenbarge, who's our finance manager and plaza uh, coordinator, um, a huge fan of this space, said that once the, the drug folks were there, and then once a number of, enough people were there having lunch, people that are doing illicit activity want to do it in the dark. They don't want to be seen, so they wandered off. And that's, you know, it's time for us to seriously reclaim this space. That's the trust fund money that we're going to be using. As you know, the common is a little bit tired. So as we say, the master plan will be doing some major projects, major capital improvement, but maintenance is so important. It's not sexy, but it's absolutely critically important. So five million of that 28 million is a maintenance trust fund. We are one of the, we represent the, the, one of the trustees, our um, co-chair of the investment committee, Abby Mason is our trustee, Kenzie Bach is the other, and the city's CFO is the third. So there's been money accumulating in this fund for the last three years. It has over $800,000 in it. And we work with the Parks Department very closely to identify important projects that need to be done and had the trustees vote to release $400,000 for us to use for this year. So these are some of the projects that will be improved and we're working very, very closely on the ground with the Parks Department on that. 
We've been working over the last, since 2018 actually, on this project of um, restoring this monument, this amazing piece of, of uh, one of America's, if not America's greatest piece of public art by Augusta St. Gaudens to the, to the 54th Regiment and Colonel Shaw. But not just restoring the monument, with the partnership of National Park Service, the City of Boston, and the Museum of African American History, using it as a platform for dialogue about race and social justice. How many people have either gone to our in-person event that was in the before times, or our uh, virtual community conversations? Great. They were provocative, they were thought-provoking, it's not a not just a monument. None of these monuments are just monuments. They are stories and they are challenges. So we are having a rededication ceremony on June 1st because of the limitations of space and COVID. We are going to be closing Beacon Street and having an invited guest area, maybe 500 people in the front, and inviting you know elected officials uh, nationally as well as locally. But we will have a jumbotron. We'll be streaming, live streaming this event in the common, and then we'll have a tent later on where you can come and look at videos and and review materials and also sign a Witness to History book. So this has been an amazing opportunity for us to have a bigger dialogue. And we have learned from this. We will be applying what we have learned to other monuments in our parks and to scrutinize them and understand what the layers of reality of them are. And also, what are those untold and unspoken voices and, and narratives in the park? So how can we use both temporary art and, and programming events to lift up those particularly indigenous voices because there is no monument. And actually once uh, the embrace was proposed to the common, I started getting emails from people about what about an indigenous monument. People want these voices to be told. We don't have to do it in permanent monuments, but we do need to find creative, provocative ways of bringing and broadening those voices um, because they owned this space or they lived on this space before we came along and we have a lot of repair and, uh, and learning and growing to do in that, in that regard. So this is the building that those green ambassadors were in front of earlier. It is the Tool House. We were successful in working with uh, our city council, Kenzie Bach, and Ryan Lewis to get money in the, in the uh, budget of public facilities to start repair work. And that money just sat there at, for several years. And we have to now start fighting and pushing and, and uh, Councilor has been working on that, we've been working on that. This building is a beautiful stick style, 19th century structure, the maintenance uh, shed. Um, and we would like to explore the opportunity for some, either right at the building or right in the vicinity of the building, some little interpretive exhibit. This is probably the only public garden in the country where you don't, can't learn anything when you go in. I mean, you can read a, a label and understand what the name of a tree is, but the history of the garden and the gardeners and what's, what the opportunities are today. So we're gonna be exploring that. The, the most important thing right now, the, the crisis moment, is restoring this building that is in deteriorated, seriously deteriorated shape. And we are going back to real life in our events. So Mother's Day, come and enjoy Duckling Day. It's just the cutest event in Boston, and uh, it's been online. We've been doing it virtually, and our amazing staff has pulled pulled off incredible virtual events. Um, but it's not like the, the real thing. So we'll be there, rain or shine, and it will be a wonderful event. My personal favorite is in the lower right. It's making history on the common. And we actually started that in our 40th anniversary. It was to celebrate our 40th anniversary now. So it's 12 years old. A thousand school children from third to fifth grade from all over Boston come and learn about the layers of history with a, at least half a dozen partners that we work with, the 54 three enactors, the Wampanoag singers and dancers, Freedom Trail Foundation, um, historic New England. So it's just a really beautiful day. And you heard Leslie talk about our um, 50th anniversary that went underground but didn't stop. <laughs> we are at the final stage of this $5 million capital campaign to do transformative projects in each of our park. We're now down to $333,000. So thank you so much for all of you, any of you who have contributed to this. It's just wonderful. And uh, we're still open for business <laughs> to finish that, to finish this campaign. But on the mall, we've been lighting the statues down the mall, and Collins is the one that's shown here. It's the one that we lit this year. Uh, last year, we lit the Morrison, and we hope 
it is supply chain, folks. If we can get the lights, we will light four statues this year. Um, but it really is a supply chain challenge, and we hope we can we can make it happen. So on the right is the one of the child fountains at the Arlington Street entrance to the garden. It'll be wonderful to have those functioning, restored, and the entrance landscape improved. And of that five million, one million dollars is endowment. We don't do anything specifically fountains because they're fussy. The plumber, I always say, is like one of the most important people that we hire. <laughs> and we never had a great track record in Boston of keeping fountains running. It's because it takes a lot of time and money. So a million dollars is the endowment to keep these fountains running. So once they, they start, we are going to keep them going, which should be wonderful. Who went to see what we have in common last fall on the common? Oh, great. It was really wonderful. So because we're doing this master plan, we decided not to do a permanent improvement in the common until we had the master plan done. We chose to do a temporary art installation. And it turned out to be just a wonderful experience. It was a performance piece, ultimately, with 12 guides that interacted with you, asking you questions. Within that oak cabinet, those of you went, you understood that they took out markers, blue markers, that had questions. Who owns the city? Who owns the moon? Who owns your data? So it was, it was an engagement that these guys had with 16,000 people over that month, and 140,000 people were engaged in social media. You know, what, what does it mean to own something in common? What does it mean to own this park in common? And how do we care for those common resources and pass them on to the next generation better than we found it? So we've learned a lot also that we can apply when we think back on that Monument and Memory Task Force. How can we employ temporary art in creative, simple ways to tell stories? And you can be more provocative and experimental with temporary art than you can with permanent art. Uh, the Green and White Ball is going to be in person again next week. Uh, thank you again to all of you who have uh, bought tickets. We still have a few more. I think we're going to sell out soon, but uh, we're very excited to be able to be in one of those companies. This is the single largest fundraiser of the year, uh, beyond all the wonderful contributions through memberships and, and other ways. Being able to have this, this fundraiser allows us to do all that work I've been talking about. And the last thing I'll just touch on is the fact that our parks are on the left, and they clearly are our mission to care for these three parks, care for them and advocate for them. But they don't exist in isolation. They exist in an ecosystem of parks throughout the city. So we are a very important uh, participant in Boston Park Advocates, a citywide network of over 100 park advocate organizations and individuals speaking out on behalf of, of the parks of the city. And we have the luxury of having a staffed organization and having an endowment and having you know, funds. There are many uh, parks in the city that have volunteer organizations. So to be able to join our voices together and raise up our voices to say, parks need funding. It's so in easy to see, of course, that school does and the firehouse does and the police and, and there's the youth and there's, of course, affordable housing. There's so many needs that are obvious. People don't always understand going back to $862,000 just for the turf and the trees and the soil on our parks. So we keep advocating every year for the Parks Department budget, for the DCR state budget. Half of the acreage in, in Boston is state parkland and half is city parkland. I was very excited to see that this budget has four additional staff for the tree division. And that did not happen without our advocacy. So continue, we always have to continue to speak up on behalf of, we speak for the trees, literally, because they need us. And so I just, again, want to thank you so much for being here, for supporting us, for being friend, and for caring about these parks. This is what it gets all of us, this beauty. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Lee Edwards. <laughs> Lydia has the distinction of still being a city councilor, representing the North End, East Boston, and Charleston for one more week <laughs> until April 30th, as well as our state senator from the 1st, Suffolk, and Middlesex district. And she now has to run for her seat again because of redistricting. So she really, she didn't just run a marathon, she's running a lot of other things as well. Senator Edwards has spent her entire career as an advocate, activist, and a voice on behalf of society's most vulnerable. 
She served as the deputy director within the mayor's office of housing stability, where she was responsible for developing and delivering solutions to fight displacement. She worked as a public interest attorney with Greater Boston Legal Services and served as statewide campaign coordinator for the Massachusetts Coalition for Domestic Workers, which advocated for passage of the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. In 2015, she was named Bostonian of the Year by the Boston Globe. speak to you today. Um, I was told, you know, I would just tell a little bit about my story, but I do want to acknowledge the incredible work and the importance of parks and, of course, all of your support in the last two years. You know, and seeing the presentation and, under, and, and also living in East Boston by an airport and a huge park, you really do understand that parks are ecosystems of community. Uh, they really are where community can thrive grow, build on each other, uh, and a properly stewarded park is a, demonstrates a properly stewarded community. And so what I see in what your work has created, and it's going to last for generations, I, I'm just amazed and inspired, and I just want to thank you all. Um, a little bit about me, um, I am uh, the senator now for the First Suffolk and Middlesex. I work with my a good friend, Representative Jay Livingston, who supported me in becoming a senator, so I want to thank Jay, always, thank you. Um, I am a lot of things. Um, I'm the first woman to represent this district. I'm the first person of color to represent this district. I'm also the first homeowner in my family. I'm the first uh, lawyer in my family. And I guess what I'm trying to say is I, uh, I don't mind just trying. Um, being out there, uh, breaking down whatever barriers, uh, and uh, sometimes I've never seen it done in my family before, or done by someone before, but I, I, I move anyway. Uh, and, and I've learned to do that uh, because of people, volunteers in the community who have invested uh, their lives and time in giving for causes, whether they were my teachers, whether they were my coaches, whether they were people who were uh, dedicated to beautification, uh, because it was bigger than them. You know that the world in this moment, in this time, is bigger than any one of you individually. And you know that the dollars that you are raising isn't about just what is pretty at the moment. Uh, in this particular moment, in this particular pandemic, this ecosystem was vital to survival. Having a place with clean air, having a place where people could convene, see each other safely, in a pandemic was vital for mental health, emotional health and well-being. It was vital for children to be able to thrive and to have something. And so when I think about what we are raising money for and what we're celebrating, it's our resilience. It's our ability as human beings to come together for each other. We see that in this park, we see this in mutual aid societies that popped up all over the city. And so the question for many of us is what do we do with all of this now? The lessons that we've learned, the people that we've met, the ecosystem that survived. And I can tell you throughout my life, uh, what you do and what I've learned is you pay it forward and you spread it as far as you possibly can. I was the recipient of that. I am somebody's unknown person that they had no idea that their investment was going to help. I was, my family received donations from an anonymous source. Uh, they, in, our, in our mailbox when we struggled financially, it was signed, your guardian angel. Um, this is after my mother retired from the United States Air Force and we were in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, most of you think it's Canada. It's the part that sticks out <laughs> in Wisconsin. I mean, Michigan's like this, and there's a part that goes like this over it, and I'm from there, <laughs> in there. Uh, and I talk about sticking out a little bit. Um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I think, is uh, extremely not diverse. And uh, so it was myself, I have a twin sister, so we stuck out already. And then uh, there was uh, a young man uh, who 
was two years older than us, named Michael Jackson. He was the, we were the African Americans at the high school. I've uh, got my graduating class of 99 people. My sister married Michael Jackson. <laughs> He's my brother-in-law, and uh, they live with my nephew in North Carolina. I'm going to see them this weekend. <laughs> in any event, um, we stick out in a small town in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, where you can go to the mines, you can work in the hospital, or you can work in the university. My mother didn't get a job at either one of any of those, and so she worked two jobs and made the minimum wage, which is $5.15 an hour. I had a job, and so did Eric. And as a result, many people seeing us work so hard, we had people invest in us that I still don't know who did that, such as my guardian angel. And my whole life, I will do everything I can to be someone else's guardian angel. Um, uh, when I went on to law school, and graduated from Holland, uh, from American University, went, uh, I was recruited by Holland and I had to come to this beautiful city of Boston. And I came here, loved it, and I was the first to make it this far in my family, and I wanted nothing more than to pay for my mother to stop having to work, because she was still working two jobs. And unfortunately, the recession hit, and I lost my job. But I found myself. I ended up starting a legal clinic for domestic workers. And I learned Portuguese, and then I learned Spanish, and I learned, honestly, I was meant to be a guardian angel. That's what this JD was for, and I loved it. I loved everything that I was doing every single day and who I was fighting for because so many of them reminded me of my mother. Coming home, tired, exhausted, and sometimes not with the money to pay the rent. And so I think a lot of my life is fighting for my mom still and fighting to make sure that she is seen and valued through fighting for other people's mothers, <laughs> through fighting for other people's dads and workers. Um, but it's an honor to be that guardian angel when you can be. And so in case you were curious, by you investing in this ecosystem of community, you become stewards and guardian angels of young Lydia's and people in the future who you may never meet. You don't know who is able to come to your events, sit down and be inspired of all the things she or he can do because for the first time they're around, surrounded by beauty that they have never seen before. You don't know the person who is going to see this art on the public bathroom and think incredible thoughts about the poetry, about the art that they're going to be inspired to write. You don't know who you're being a guardian angel for sometimes, but trust and believe every now and then they become a state senator. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, I, um, I had, did not know I'd be here, but because of the blind giving stewardship of guardian angels from whether they were my teachers, again, my coaches, people who did things, just randomly gave me rides along the way. I am here now. And I will do everything I can to be a guardian angel for people um, as a senator and hopefully build a bridge between our district. My district now is the first Suffolk and Middlesex, but I'm running for the third Suffolk, which will include um, all the parks, uh, and, and, and Back Bay. It does not include Cambridge Port anymore. That's the part that I am giving up. But then on the other side of the harbor, I have Winthrop and Riviera Beach, Boston. And this is a tale of two different worlds. You have a working class, immigrant base, struggling side across the harbor, and you have a more affluent side on the other side. And I want nothing more in the time that I am your senator to build the strongest bridge we've ever had for this Senate district. I want my kids from East Boston and Revere to come here. I want your kids and you to come up to East Boston and see our parks. Come have the best tamales you've ever had in your life. <laughs> I'm serious. The Serpent is amazing. Come see us. You will find the stewardship, the guardian angels speak so many beautiful languages, come from so many different backgrounds. And it's in that mutual aid that we begin to see each other create a bigger, stronger, equitable ecosystem of community. And I am honored to be your senator to do that. So thank you for having me here tonight, and thank you for this opportunity.
same piece of clothing, one of my people picked it up and it went to Big Brothers and Little Sisters. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Senator, what can we do to increase the amount of funding for parks in the state budget? A um, couple, couple things. Uh, we, well, one, advocacy. I mean, honestly, being direct and honest with us about what you feel is necessary. But when you advocate, just don't talk about what it goes into, but talk about the return on the investment, right? It's generational beauty. It's generational mental health. It's generational healing that comes with these dollars. And I think that that's really what speaks to the fiscal stewardship. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, it's a park. You know, I'm not going to put ARPA money in that. I got to put it in housing. I got to put it in other infrastructure. And what I just said about the ecosystem and the numbers that you have to back it up will really help that argument to get more money for parks. Yes. Um, Senator, you had talked about this bridge um, between two Boston's and also the park in East Boston. I'm wondering, in terms of this organization, how could we help with building the bridge to support the park in East Boston? Oh, I would, well, first of all, I mean, we have uh, friends of the Mary Ellen Greenway. Uh, Mary Ellen was a steward and one of the biggest fighters against the airport to keep our green space, and so I wanted to bring her into this space. But I would love for you to come uh, meet our friends of the Greenway. I think in many cases helping us to understand a little bit more about what stewardship looks like. Um, coming joint events, if we were to have one, I'm thinking about an open concert in East Boston, a Latin jazz festival after a friend of mine, Andrea Campbell, actually did a Mattapan jazz festival. But trying to bring about just beauty, music, and being. Uh, so coming, joining us uh, as we have events would be huge. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Senator, for being here. It's wonderful to hear your story. It, we really look forward to working with you and, and, and making those bridges because, as I said earlier, it's an ecosystem of the whole city and whatever we can do to make ourselves go both ways. And as you said, Amrita, it, it goes both ways. And, and the beauty of coming, having the, the embrace come to the park is that 2.7 miles between Nubian Square and the Common, that's not a long distance. We need to bridge that distance, we need to experience that distance and go to Nubian Square as well as people being encouraged and, and happy to come to the common to see that, that sculpture. So with this, we conclude our formal presentation of the evening and we look forward to having all of you come with, for some reception and conversation. Again, thank you so much for being here.